Good morning, everyone, uh, and Happy New Year. Um, my name is Nikos Tsafos, and I'm a senior fellow with the Energy and National Security Program here at uh, CSIS, and I'm very excited for this morning's conversation with Thane Gustafsson. Uh, before I introduce Thane and we start our discussion, uh, just a safety announcement. We take your safety very seriously here at CSIS. We're not expecting anything, but if there is an announcement, uh, just follow my lead and my colleagues, and be aware of the emergency exits. Uh, obviously, the easiest way out, if it's available, is uh, going out the way you came in behind you. Um, so with that, um, we're here to uh, talk with Thane about his new book, The Bridge, um, Natural Gas in a Redivided Europe, uh, which came out yesterday. So first of all, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, and uh, this is the first uh, public uh, event for the book, so we're very excited that Thane has chosen CSIS to come and, uh, and talk about the book. Um, you know, I'm not going to read sort of Thane's bio, but um, you know, to those of you who have been following uh, the Soviet Union, Russia, and, 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 and natural gas and energy, you know, Thane is a very familiar face and voice. Uh, you know, I uh, was briefly a colleague of, of Thane's at, at IHS. Uh, I woke up one day and the company I worked for had been acquired by IHS and so overnight I got an additional eight and a half thousand colleagues and one of the people I was most excited to work with and, and learn from was Thane because he's been one of those people that has been writing about this topic uh, for a long time with, with great clarity and precision and uh, you know when the Ukraine conflict sort of flared up and there were sanctions on Russia and people were trying to figure out what will this do you know, I turned to one of Thane's monographs from uh, the mid-80s on the Soviet gas campaign. So this is someone who's been thinking about the interplay of energy and, and Russia and in Europe for a very long time. And so we're very grateful that he's chosen to come here and present, uh, present his book. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to first sort of kick it off to Thane to sort of give us the, the pitch for the book, uh, what is it about, what are the main points. And then he and I are going to do a little bit of a conversation, and then we're going to bring you uh, all in to, uh, to ask your questions. Uh, so with that, uh, Thane, welcome. Well, Nick, thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure to be your colleague at IHS. Uh, and it's a pleasure, in a sense, to be reunited with you once again at CSIS. Uh, as I explained to Nick this morning, uh, I used to have Nick's job uh, back <laughs> 40 years ago, if you can believe that. Uh, and the story is that there was a very rich Chicago entrepreneur named William Wood Prince, uh, who had made a fortune in the meatpacking uh, business. And he came to William Abshire one day, the founder of CSIS, and he said, I think that the internet is going to spell the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, and I want CSIS as a leader, as a thought leader, uh, to uh, be one of the, to, to have a Soviet studies program that will uh, study the internet, the impact of the internet and high technology on the Soviet Union, and help bring about the end of the Soviet Union. And here's my check for a million, for a million dollars, get started. Well, CSIS didn't have a Soviet studies program at the time, uh, so they looked around, and I was at the Rand Corporation uh, in those days, uh, and they came to me and they said, come to Washington and start this Soviet studies program, uh, which I did, CSIS being part of Georgetown at the time. So how that, that's how my Georgetown uh, life started. So um, history always repeats itself. <laughs> and it repeats itself in another amusing way uh, in that uh, what I was doing at the Rand Corporation was working on an assignment for the National Security Council. And this was uh, early 80s in the Reagan administration. And the, the Ruskies were up to their usual sinister thing, building gas pipelines to Europe. And the Reagan administration was determined to try to stop this, uh, if possible, by uh, stopping the <clears throat> through, through a, an embargo on compressor technology for the pipeline. And so this was duly then implemented uh, as American strategy. And the Europeans rebelled. Uh, one, of, one of the most amusing episodes in my life was actually taking a, a trip throughout Europe in the, in the months following the American embargo and being treated to very lavish lunches by European 
um, compressor manufacturers, <laughs> Nuovo Pignone, et cetera. Uh, and during these lunches, they spent their time laughing at the US administration and how they were going ahead and doing business with the Ruskies anyway. So does history repeat itself? Uh, here we are again, uh, trying to stop a uh, Russian pipeline, Nord Stream 2, and it all seems so familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> Except that everything is different. And that's the starting point, actually, for this book. Um, I started out uh, five years ago thinking that I was going to write a history of the Russian, the Soviet, Russian gas industry, Gazprom and so on. I just finished a book on the Russian oil industry, so why not? And it didn't take before, very long before I realized that Russian gas and Gazprom were only half of the story. And the other half was a revolution that had taken place, that was taking place before our very eyes uh, in the European gas industry. And this revolution had two parts. One was technology uh, with the advent of computer trading hubs, computerized uh, trading systems, um, uh, and uh, consequently the way you, you sell gas in Europe and the way gas is consumed is completely different from the old system that the Russians in particular had grown up under of long-term long contracts, take or pay provisions, things very familiar to the industry for, for going on a century in the United States uh, and that were basically the language of gas business invented in Holland uh, with the discovery of the first gas in Honingen and so on. And this is a revolution that has rolled on and has now completely taken control of the European gas industry. And what this does is to flip the uh, leverage that used to be in the hands of the supplier. Uh, it was not inconceivable that the Soviets and then the Russians could shut off the gas and indeed they did in 2006 and 2009 in the course of disputes with the Ukrainians. That is no longer possible today. Or if you were attempt to attempt such a thing, you would destroy your business overnight. Uh, in fact, the, the Russians have had to learn, um, initially very reluctantly, uh, that if they want to sell gas in Europe, they've got to do that under the new revolutionized system. So compared to where we were when I was at the RAND Corporation, the geostrategic situation has changed completely. And this is true for another reason, which is that Brussels has entered the picture. And so a large part of the book is about Brussels and how this came about. It's a revolution made in Chicago, at the University of Chicago this time, uh, from the Department of Economics. It's the whole school of neoliberal thought that then swept the, swept the United States, swept the Reagan administration, was communicated to, to Thatcher uh, and the Thatcherites in Britain, and then migrated over to Brussels and through a handful of British civil servants became the basis for the uh, entire single European market strategy that was implemented by a British uh, uh, a long forgot, forgotten name, now Lord or Arthur Cofield, who was working for Jacques Delors, the president of the commission, and invented the single European market strategy, which then was applied to energy and became the gas and power directives, the first, the second, and is probably familiar to you all as the third, now called the third energy package. This imposes EU rules on the ways that you transport and sell gas in the European market. So not only if you're a Russian supplier or any other supplier, whether it's an LNG supplier, whether it's Chenier, whether it's the Norwegians, whether it's anybody selling gas into Europe, you have to do it by the new technologies and the EU rules. That has been the total transformation. This story, by the way, took place, it unfolds over a period of 20 to 30 years, and largely with the Russians as passive spectators in all of this. So the amusing thing is that when the Russians are under current conditions, uh, are selling gas, they encounter a world that is completely different from the one that Gazprom 
uh, first experienced when it first started selling gas directly into Europe at the end of the Soviet Union. So much so that Gazprom has been highly frustrated by all of this. They've been very vocal about their opposition to the third package. Uh, Vladimir Putin has had some choice language about the third package. Uh, since he's a lawyer by training, he's had a few, uh, in fact, legal arguments. But my favorite comment came from Alexander Medvedev, the head of Gazprom Export, uh, recently, uh, still, I think, a, uh, a senior vice president in the, in the management board. At one time, confronted with the third package, he spluttered, but, but, but this is communism. <laughs> <laughs> and that says it all. That says it all. So that's basically what this story is about. I started out as a, as a history of the, of the Russian gas industry. I realized that the story was, was missing the other half, and I had to stop and restudy everything, start it from scratch. I didn't so much as know the name of Arthur Cofield, and yet that was a key figure. I barely remembered the name of Jacques Delors, <laughs> and the story of the gas and power directives was totally new to me, and so I had to study it from the ground up. And that is half of the story that's contained in this book. The, uh, put it this way, think of it this way. Two waves of change rolling into Europe over the last half century. And this, uh, this is my attempt to move up to 30,000 feet and to get away from Nord Stream 2, to get away from the latest news on Ukraine, because that's old news. Um, what the book basically tries to do at 30,000 feet is to show what happens when a powerful current coming from Brussels, coming from technology, sweeps across Europe, and another powerful current comes out of Russia, actually in the form of the, the old gas ideology, and they collide. And where do they collide? They collide, first of all, in the DG Comp story, which was a defeat for Gazprom at the hands of the Brussels Commission. That's very important. We can come back to that. And where do they collide? In Germany. And so a large part of this book is about how the new gas world led to the collapse of the old German gas world, along with its Russian partners in wind gas and Ventersal. And so you have in the book two stories about how that happened in Germany, the explosion that ripped apart the German gas and power industry. And the Germans to this day have not recovered. This is one of the reasons, by the way, why the Energiewende in Germany has been able to get so far and sweep so far, because the opposition of the conservative establishment had been destroyed. And there was very little standing in the way. So these stories are connected. And finally, the book looks ahead to what is the real story ahead and that is the whole question of the future of gas in Europe and indeed in the world. And this is what Gazprom is worrying about. This is what Putin is actually, he's always been a hands-on gas guy. Putin is worrying about, and this is going to be the critical future question of the whole industry for Gazprom, for the Russians, for the Europeans, for us, for our LNG producers, for Freedom Gas, what is the future of gas going to be? That's the real question. So that's my very brief introduction. Uh, I'm conscious of the fact that on January 1st, you may not have realized this. Um, we certainly didn't as we were recovering from the night before. But World War III was avoided. The Russian-Ukrainian gas contract expired on December 31st of this year. And all of a sudden, a month before that, only a month before that, it looked as though there would be no basis for Russian transit of gas through Ukraine to Europe. Were we facing another cutoff of Russian gas to Europe? Well, that was averted. And so the good news here is that over the last month, the Russians and the Ukrainians actually hammered out a deal in which, interestingly, the Russians, in fact, Putin himself, clearly, hands-on, Putin himself made the key, connect, key concessions that enabled a new transit agreement to be hammered out, and it was literally signed on December 31st. 
So World War III will not break out. Nord Stream 2 will continue, although it will be slower than before. Gas will flow through Ukraine, and we can go on to continue arguing about Russian and Ukrainian and European gas. So we're very glad to see you here this morning. Such a good turnout, despite the snow yesterday. So welcome, and thank you, Nick, for the, for the nice platform. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was, that was you, wonderful. You've got the book. I'm supposed to take the book and obeying the motto of my, my mentor, <laughs> Daniel Jurgen, he says, wave the book, wave the book. Wave right? the book. So I'm waving the book. And it's and Nick's copy, though. Wave the book and then recommend that people buy the book, because waving the book doesn't make money. <laughs> um, um, let me ask you, you put a lot on the table, so I want to unpack a few things. And I wanted to start from Gazprom, actually, because you said this almost started as a history of Gazprom. There's a lot about Gazprom in this book. It's a company that, you know, if, especially in this town, you say Gazprom, the first thing that comes up is tool of the Kremlin. Basically, they're one of the same. There's a lot more to Gazprom. So talk a little bit about Gazprom and how we should think about Gazprom. Well, Gazprom, like any large corporations, uh, large corporation has a lot of different moving parts. Uh, and this has been true of the uh, Soviet gas industry from, from the beginning. Uh, and by the way, I, I can't resist. I, I throw a lot of human interest stories into the book, so I'm going to interrupt myself, if I may, uh, with a slight um, um, detour to pay tribute to the founder of the Soviet gas industry, a man named Alexei Kartunov, who is also forgotten as a, as a name. Uh, and yet, he uh, appeared, if you watched this summer, the extraordinary series on Chernobyl. How many, how many people watched that series on, on Chernobyl? Well, those of you who, who have, have not seen it should drop everything and, and go watch it. It is, it is absolutely extraordinary. Matt, would you agree? Matt Sager's in the audience. Would, did, you, did you watch it? When I saw the, the, the teacups and some of the shots, I go, I'm there. I'm there. <laughs> It, if for anybody who, who, who lived in the Soviet Union and traveled there in the old days, they managed the exploit of recreating the, the feel of the place act, as it actually was. Well, as the Chernobyl episode uh, unfolded, uh, the Kremlin itself was in the dark about what was going on. And Gorbachev turned to his deputy prime minister for energy, a man named Boris Sherbina. Those of you who've seen the, seen the series will remember who he was. And Gorbachev said to Sherbina, go down there, Boris, and find out what the hell is going on down there. Well, he did, and he made some of the key decisions that actually prevented a total meltdown of the, the Chernobyl 4 reactor. Uh, so we owe him big time. All of Eastern Europe owes Sherbina big time. He got too close to the reactor, though, and he got a, a, a deadly dose of radiation, and he died of cancer four years later. Well, Sherbina is one of, the his, one of the heroes of my book, because Sherbina was sent initially to East Siberia to build the huge, the mammoth Soviet hydropower program. And he did it so well that he became Mr. Hydropower for the, for the Soviets. So when the Soviets wanted to build a huge hydropower project in West Siberia, they called for Mr. Hydropower, and they said, Boris, go there to this place called Tumin and build the Middle Orb hydropower project. So he did. And so there he is. He's got his mission. He's the head of the party apparatus there. And the local geologists come to him. And they say, Comrade Shrebina, what you're doing is crazy. You're about to build a huge hydropower dam with a reservoir the size of the Baltic on top of the world's largest oil and gas resources. This is madness. You must not do this. And they got to Sherbina. He went native. And he went to the Kremlin. And he knocked on doors and said, you got to stop this. Now, hydropower, you have to remember, was a KGB industry not too long before that. Say so they had the influence in town. But Shabina managed to get to Kosygin and turn Kosygin around. And the rest is history. And from that point on, Shabina became Mr. Gas and Power. That's how he come, 
to be deputy prime minister of the Soviet Union, and he gets sent down by Gorbachev to, uh, to Chernobyl. So watch the series, and you will be <laughs> struck by this amazing figure. He's the hero of the, of the series. series. Uh, and that's also a, a gas story. And that's the foundation of Gazprom. Well, uh, uh, Sherbina then favored uh, the, man, the, uh, the man I was just speaking of, uh, Alexei Kortunov. And Kortunov knew that the only way you were going to get gas in the Soviet Union was with Western compressors and Western pipe and Western money. So he was the one who sold to the Kremlin the idea of, of selling gas to Europe. And the Kremlin reacted, of course, by saying, no, you're crazy, we can't do that. It's got to be reserved for Mother Russia, et cetera. And Kortunov sent on a secret mission to ENI the, his young compressor specialist, a man named Dirigeov. Those of you who've dealt with Gazprom will remember the name Dirigeov because 50 years later, he was in charge of Gazprom's foreign relations office. He sent on a secret mission to Italy, Dirigeov, to talk to the Italians about a pipeline to Europe. And the Italians reacted by saying, you're crazy. How many thousands of miles is that from West Siberia to Italy? But Dirigeov persisted, went back, reported to Kortunov. Kortunov then reported once again to the one man who would listen, Kosygin, and that was the start of the pipeline project. Pretty soon they got the Austrians to listen. The Germans started coming on board because they would be supplying the pipe. And that was the birth of the first pipeline. And it was also the birth of Gazprom. So you have this line of descent from production in West Siberia from Gazprom. And that engineering line of descent is still the core of the company. But they've built on, in particular, the whole part that deals with foreign uh, partners, Gazprom Export. Now, those guys have a completely different corporate culture. They used to be part of the USSR Ministry of Foreign Trade. And then they were grabbed and absorbed by Gazprom, but never quite. They have a completely different corporate culture. They are the guys who pioneered LNG uh, in Gazprom to the extent that there are LNG pioneers in Gazprom. They sell the stuff. They don't, they don't produce it, but they sell it. Uh, and um, so in answer to your question, which Gazprom do you have in mind? That's, that's the question. And that's also the very frustrating question for Vladimir Putin, because there is one corporate division in Gazprom that's missing, and that's the LNG division. And so for these past 20 years, Putin has been saying to Gazprom, come on, get with it, get with it. I want an LNG capability. And Gazprom keeps saying, no, 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 we don't do that. We do pipeline gas. I want a capability to take gas to East Asia. And Gazprom historically has been saying, no, 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 we don't, we don't do East Asia. Now, very reluctantly, they have finally done East Asia with a pipeline. And so Putin has done an amazing thing. Coming back to your question about Gazprom, Gazprom does not do LNG. So looking for a champion, Putin turned to one guy who actually, from the ground up, a genuine private sector startup, Novatech, under a man named Leonid Mechelson, a genuine entrepreneur, has basically started an LNG capability in Russia, and he is Russia's LNG champion and not Gazprom. So Gazprom stuck, is one way of summarizing the situation. They're stuck with a European industry that they cannot, cannot, cannot intimidate, they're stuck with a Ukraine that is increasingly independent of Russian gas. And they're stuck with a Kremlin that has basically abandoned them for the future of, of, of gas, which is LNG. I'm very glad that I'm not the head of Gazprom right now. <laughs> um, let me take you to a, another theme that you talk about in the book. You know, We spent a lot of time in this town, and, and definitely in our program, talking about the interplay between energy and geopolitics. And one of the things that struck me as I, as I read through the, the text is, you know, there are times when you describe, let me get this right, that the trade was a stabilizing and confidence building force during the Cold War. Other times it's a source of conflict when it comes to Ukraine and liberalization. 
and at other times you describe the two as almost independent of each other. You, you have this great line that says, yet the underlying driver is simplicity itself. Since Russia has gas and Europe needs gas, and the gas serves both sides profitably, and that's why it all happens. So how do we think about, not just in this relationship, but more broadly, that interplay? Is it confidence building, a source of tension? Does it exist independent? Does it depend on the circumstances? How do you think about that? Well, that's the crucial question. Uh, there are two sides to the gas business uh, all over the world, but particularly uh, in the pipeline era and particularly in Europe. Uh, a pipeline, first of all, has the property of connecting the supplier and, and the buyer in, in an intimate relationship. It's, a, it's an umbilical cord. And once the pipeline is built, and to that extent the Reagan administration was absolutely correct, uh, once the pipeline is built, it locks the supplier and the buyer, historically at any rate, into an intimate relationship. You can't pick up the pipeline and move it once it's been built. Um, but as the business then develops uh, and as it's conducted, there's always a dance between the commercial aspect and the geopolitical aspect. And they, they influence one another as they go forward. Now, one of the things I wanted to do with this book, both for my personal exploration but also for the reader, uh, was to explore the commercial side. Because growing, being at Rand, I had, of course, been drawn in through the geopolitical side. What I discovered was that the commercial side is very powerful. And most of the time, it's the commercial side that actually dictates the, th the way things work out. Uh, and this is a part of the story that tends to be neglected by, the, by people who are in the geopolitical world, as most of us are in Washington, and indeed as most people are in Berlin. Uh, the headquarters of the commercial side will be found in places like Kassel in Germany. Who goes to visit Kassel? Uh, but we all visit Berlin. And so we're familiar with the German geopolitical side of the story. But in actual fact, if you're going to track what's really happening, and in particular this, the, the hubs, the commercial part, technological revolution, et cetera, you have to start from the commercial side and weave them, weave them together. Now, it's in this respect that the Russian-European gas relationship developed as part of Willy Brandt and the Ostpolitik. So it's driven in the first instance by the Germans looking for something to put in place to stabilize east-west relations. But what gives them the opportunity is that virtually simultaneously and almost independently, the Austrians and the Germans are talking to the Soviets in a small castle on a lake near Vienna. And I tell that story too. So you'll like this book. There are lots of stories in there about human beings. <laughs> Wait, the book bless you. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> okay, so there they are at the castle, and they are making they are discussing, of course, crucial things like the price of gas. What's the price of gas going to be? And you can imagine what the conversation is like. But halfway through the conversation, the German the, the, the German Foreign Office starts to show up. The Kanzleramt from, from the Chancellor's office starts to show up. And they start encouraging, come on guys, get on with these negotiations. The boss, by this time Chancellor Brandt, wants something to sign. Come on, come on. And there's a very visible process of the political, the geopolitical, pushing the commercial to get the deal done. And finally when it's done, it is a price agreement and it is at the same time the foundation of Ostpolitik, and the two come together. And that's the birth of this relationship, which this then goes on, it chugs along, out of sight most of the time, practically until we get to mm, the early 1990s when the Russians come into Germany and start found, and found a, found a joint venture. Then it goes out of sight again and chugs along as, as Wintershal develops a rival new business in Germany chugs along, chugs along, till we get to 2006, 2009, and all of a sudden the gas is cut off, and the world takes notice. 
takes notice of a geopolitical fact. But underlying those two cutoffs, if you look at the details, was a series of running price disagreements and delivery disagreements, very technical. I challenge you to read this stuff without falling asleep. It is amazingly technical, and yet that was the basis of the falling out that led to the gas cutoff. A disaster as far as Gazprom was concerned. Uh, if, you, if you have a quiet conversation in confidence with Gazprom people and you take them back to the famous cutoff, they, they, they kind of look very embarrassed. It was a huge hit to, commer to Gazprom's commercial reputation. The, the decision obviously was made in the Kremlin uh, and was made entirely. It was, it was a, an explosion of impatience, shall we say, over a very difficult relationship between Russia and Ukraine. So I, I went into some detours in trying to answer your question. But the bottom line is that there are many Gazproms as they evolve. And one has to try to distinguish the commercial from the geopolitical, and then distinguish those parts of Gazprom that want to see the business continue smoothly and accept the fact that it's on European grounds, and those who continue to think on, in, in geopolitical terms as well. On the whole, it's been, on the whole, it's been a successful relationship. Um, you talked a little bit about China. Uh, and one of the themes that is recurring through the book is sort of the evolution of the European gas market and the liberalization. Um, China looks a little bit different. Um, so talk about sort of the engagement with, with China and, and how we should think about that in similar or different ways than the engagement with Europe. The China story, um, one part of the China story, shall I say the commercial part, the, the technical part of the China, the China story, uh, begins very near Lake Baikal uh, in a place called Kavikta. Uh, and this uh, prospect, which had been first located by, a, by local entrepreneurs in, uh, in Irkutsk, in East Siberia, came to the attention of BP. And BP spent a lot of money exploring Kavikta and realizing that it was, in fact, a, a, a uh, a, a, a very significant prospect. Uh, and uh, BP early on realized the only place for this gas is China. And so BP made the first overtures to, to uh, Beijing through their representative in Beijing. And the plan that they were trying to sell to the Chinese was gas from Kavukta straight line through Mongolia to eastern China. Well, the Chinese were not ready for this at the time. Uh, ironically, if you've been following the, uh, the, the latest newspapers just in the last month, uh, the idea of a straight line through Mongolia is back on the table. So history repeats itself once again. Uh, BP finally gave up in frustration, uh, and the Kavukta property was acquired ultimately by Gazprom. Gazprom initially didn't know what to do with it. Uh, Alexei Miller, and the, no, his predecessor, Rem Vyakidev called it a dog at one point, uh, and so Kavukta sat there for a, long, for a long time. Then another field was discovered called Chayanda, and the, the, the Kremlin starts pushing the pivot to the east. And Gazprom at first says, we don't have anybody who does, who does Asia. We don't know anything about Asia. We've never done Asia. But they are pushed, clearly, for geopolitical reasons, uh, to look more closely at the Kavlikta Chayanda, and they start talking about a pipeline that's going to run. Well, where's it going to run to? That was an interesting question. Is it going to run to Vladivostok, uh, and it will, will it be an LNG facility? Or will it run to northeastern China, where they, they, uh, they work on coal? The, energy, the local economy work, runs on coal, bring gas to northeastern China. Then, as energy policies mature, the conversation begins to take, take shape. So this has been a, a what by now? A 40-year conversation that finally connects Kavlikta and Shayanda and brings it down to northeastern China. And now the big question is, are the Chinese ready for it? Are they ready for Russian pipeline gas? And the answer is yes, in northeast China, they'll take it right away. But 
as they extend the pipeline down, and we have in the audience an expert on these matters who is, who is with us at Georgetown this year, I'm glad to say, so we, we, get, we, we, we follow this very closely. The, uh, and also I'll mention, for the sake of advertising, a, an IHS report that's just come out on this subject, if, if I may, um, which stresses the fact that, that, that stages two and stages three are not ready in China yet. So it's going to take a full 10 years before the full capacity of what is now called the Power of Siberia Pipeline scales up to, to, its, to its full full volume, and we get then a, a lifeline of, of, of uh, pipeline gas that extends all the way to Shanghai. Wow, that's quite, a, that's quite a story. From BP all those years ago, with its vision, credit BP with the vision, to bring gas to Shanghai, where it collides with, guess what, freedom gas. So there we are with LNG versus, uh, partly US LNG in Shanghai, versus Russian pipeline gas in Shanghai. Where have we seen this story before? <laughs> okay, so that's, that's, the, that's the past and a hint of what the future looks like. Speaking about the future, I'm gonna do a couple more then I'm gonna come to you to start getting your questions ready. Um, one of the themes that you explore in the book and you kind of end on is the future of gas more broadly. Um, and one of the conversations that we've been having in this building is thinking about like a post-hydrocarbon Russia. Uh, now, post is a relative term and how quickly, how fast, and we can debate a lot of these questions. But, you know, you do sketch out a, a world in which, you know, Europe uses a lot less gas. Um, and obviously that will have huge implications uh, for Russia, so how do how do you think about that? Well, uh, Nick, first of all, thanks very much for asking that question, uh, because that's my next book. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have a contract uh, with Harvard, I should say again, to write a book uh, that's tentatively called Klimat, the future of Russia uh, in the era of climate change. So it, it addresses that question head on. How is a Hydropower, great power, uh, hydropower, hydrocarbon, great power, uh, going to adapt to a world in which hydrocarbons are the bad guys. And uh, the, the premise of the book is that climate change is real, that energy transition is real, uh, that sooner or later fossil fuels are going to be squeezed out of the mix very significantly. Uh, and this is clearly an existential crisis. Not for Russia, uh, Russia will carry on, uh, but for the hydrocarbon model that has fueled the Soviet Union very largely in its last couple decades, and that has fueled uh, the survival and the prosperity of post-Soviet Russia. This will be dramatic. The question is, how fast? And so as you, as you look carefully, and this is really turning out to be the, the big challenge for the book for me, uh, and for everybody else, of course. The big question is, if you accept that the transition is real, how fast is the transition going to be? And the more I look at these scenarios, and by the way, let me pay tribute to the oil companies who get a lot of bad press. I've looked very carefully at their scenarios. That part of those big corporations is doing a very good job. Uh, people like Spencer Dale of BP, who presented here at CSIS, this is serious work. Uh, the, the work that Chris Birdsall at ExxonMobil has been doing for, for ExxonMobil scenarios, this is, good, this is serious work, not like, not like the stuff that we, we hear about from Exxon 30 years ago. That's old, story, that's old history. The, the scenarios, even from the oil companies, foresee a world in which peak oil demand happens, and the only difference among them is when it happens and how long the peak lasts and how slow the decline is thereafter. But the one point that they are unanimous on, and they are unanimous with the more ambitious fast transition people, is that the transition is real, it's going to happen, and so the Russians confront this existential crisis. 
after looking at these scenarios for a long time, my personal guess is that the inertia of the existing system is, is going to turn out to be tremendous. And so the, the peak, uh, in my view, will not come before mid-century. And the decline will be the dominant story for our grandchildren uh, in the second half of the 21st century. And so the existential crisis is coming, but not yet a while. We'll have him back when the climat comes out to talk more about that. Um, so I wanted to come to the audience. Uh, simple rules at CSIS 1, please wait for the mic. Two, please identify yourself. Three, question in the form of a question, and bonus points for brevity. Um, anyone want to take a first pass? Gentleman right there. Thank you. Anton Fidyashin of the History Department, American University. Thank you for uh, coming to present. Um, how much of a role does um, uh, Schroeder play in this book? And can you speak a little bit about the calculation in Moscow in hiring uh, Gerhard Schroeder to play such a prominent role? And did he turn out to be more of a benefit, or is the relationship very complicated? Thank you. A simple question to start. Well, I have a great deal of respect for Gerhard Schroeder. Uh, he is a private citizen. Uh, he is free to do what he likes. Uh, he has become a member of the board of Rosneft, if I am correct, and also he is a key figure in the management board of the Nord Stream 2 consortium. That's his privilege. That's his right. Uh, so the, the, the really important I think there are two important questions that involve Gerhard Schroeder. Uh, one is, uh, what does he symbolize about the role of the Germans in this whole relationship? And Schroeder is simply, I would say, the, the most advanced case, uh, something that, that we overlook uh, that is the German story since the early 1990s, uh, that begins with the creation of the Wintershall joint venture with Gazprom, uh, uh, Wingas, and the individuals within it uh, who then made their early careers as partners of the Russians. And they, they made it their job to be not just partners with the Russians, but close friends. They vacation together. They play football together. Uh, they serve on one another's boards. They continue to uh, advance the cause of Russian-German uh, co cooperation. So the role that the uh, German companies are playing today in Nord Stream 2, for example, and the role that the German government is playing in promoting Nord Stream 2, despite Washington's objections, is a story with a long and intimate history, uh, which spreads over, by the way, into the Austrian oil company, which is now headed by the man who made wind gas in the early part of his career, Reinhard Zeller. Uh, pay tribute to him, an extraordinary figure, uh, in doing something extraordinary, by the way. When, the, when, when the, the Russians first came to Germany, the German, the German gas industry was dominated by, um, uh, by um, Ruhrgas. Uh, Ruhrgas doesn't even exist anymore, so that's the symbol of the upheaval in the German oil and ga uh, gas and power industry. But at any rate, the, Germans, uh, the Russians came to Ruhrgas uh, and they couldn't get an, a, an attractive deal from oil gas, but they got a very interested audience from the chemical giant BASF, which owns the oil and gas company Ventosal. And there were some very entrepreneurial characters. Again, I tell the story in, in, uh, in the book, some, some marvelous human interest stories of entrepreneurs in Ventosal who decided they were going to do this. But what that meant was actually building a huge $5 billion gas pipeline system in Germany on spec with no contracts. And the exploit of wind gas, of Wintersal, of BASF, was that they went across the landscape of Germany and they sold supply contracts with no pipeline to back them up. It's an amazing story of entrepreneurship. But at any rate, when you look at Gerhard Schroeder, uh, and look beyond him to the total, total story, suddenly you understand why the Germans, for example, were there as intermediaries, as, 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 as well-wishers 
in the latest round of, of Russian-Ukrainian negotiations. The Germans wanted that deal done, no doubt about it, and for reasons that are totally clear when you look at the history of the relationship. So uh, that's my convoluted answer to, to, the, to your excellent question. Hi, Michael Ratner with Congressional Research Service. Um, you, in your remarks, um, and first thank you for your remarks, and I look forward to reading the book, but in your remarks you talked about the relationship a bit between Gazprom and the Kremlin, the rise of Novatech for LNG and, and the Kremlin. Can you elaborate a bit more on the Kremlin's preferences for the different Russian companies? Um, because there is somewhat of a, a, a view, does it matter which Russian company is involved and, and how much control does the Kremlin have and, and, and um, how things may, may, may evolve depending upon who's involved in a, in a project? Uh, well, I would make two points. Um, first of all, despite my trying to write the balance and tell the commercial side of the story, uh, facts are facts. Gas is a geopolitical weapon. It has been used for geopolitical influence by the Russians. Uh, I, I, I am not uh, presenting a brief for Gazprom in this book. Uh, and there is no question about it when there is geopolitical advantage to be gained in places like Lithuania, for example, where the story is very clear, or in Belarus, gas is being used as a geopolitical weapon. Do we not use energy as a geopolitical weapon? But that's a different conversation. Uh, we're all grown-ups. And so um, the, the, uh, the question, I think, boils down to, uh, is, that, is that it? Is that all? Is the Kremlin kind of, does the Kremlin have this very narrow-minded view of gas? And here we come to Putin. Uh, what's been very remarkable about Putin ever since his St. Petersburg days uh, is that he's an energy geek. And in particular, he's a gas geek. Uh, his first big trip when, when he became president was to, uh, uh, to Turkmenistan, to Ashgabat, to try to plead for more gas for Gazprom as the newly elected president, or maybe he was just appointed prime minister at the time. But the point is his first major trip revealingly was, was a gas trip. He has been outspoken on every one of the major issues of the uh, Russian gas trade, whether it's east or west, at, at every stage. You can practically chart the history of, of the whole subject by reading Putin's speeches. Well, this leads, this kind of tempts you to the thought that Putin has had it all figured out from the beginning, the commercial as well as the geopolitical. And that would be, I think, a, a big mistake. Um, there has, there's, uh, there's, there's been too much accident in, in this history, too much that w has come unforeseen. Uh, the whole story of the European technological revolution, who could foresee that? The LNG, the shale gas revolution in the United, who could foresee those things? What genius could have come up with a coherent gas policy that would take account of all of these things? But what, what is clear is that Putin is right on every one of the strategic themes as they emerge and is constantly uh, pushing Russian gas policy and energy policy, but gas policy particularly, in the direction of the trends. So trend number one, climate change. Well, Putin doesn't like climate change, but he's, again, his speeches, follow his speeches. Putin doesn't like climate change, but he's come to accept the reality of it. And the big opportunity is the northern sea route, which Putin is pushing like crazy. One of the reasons that he's pushing LNG so much is that he sees it as a vehicle for LNG to the east. Second theme, LNG. As far as Putin is concerned, LNG is the, is the future. And he is pushing it as Russia's top gas priority, even if that means shutting out Gazprom in the process. Fascinating. Uh, third, uh, Ukraine. Putin clearly took control of the whole conversation in the last couple of months. And he overruled Gazprom 
on key issues, notably on the payment of the arbitration penalties that were due to Ukraine, but which Gazprom was refusing to pay. Gazprom's been overruled by the Kremlin. For geopolitical reasons this time, Putin has evidently decided that peace, gas peace, is uh, important to his relationship with Zelensky. What price Zelensky is going to be asked to pay as a quid pro quo is, is, is as yet to be revealed. Uh, but nevertheless, Putin has, has, has taken control and has offered a deal. So if you go through all of the major themes like that, you see that Putin is, is right on top of all of them. And they do, they do add up to a Russian gas strategy, which is turning to the east, which is turning to the northern sea route, which is based on LNG, which is based on a private sector champion. Very interesting. Can I add an addendum to this, and then I'll come back to, uh, you haven't really talked about Rosneft, but they too have sort of gas ambitions. How do they fit into this picture? Well, Rosneft is quite a story, so if I, I didn't bring a copy of my oil book, I should have waited. We can that still one. raise this one, though. So. <laughs> uh, I tell that story in the oil book, which is called Wheel of Fortune, uh, and charts the rise of Rosneft. Uh, if you go back, to, to, if you go back uh, to the early 90s, Rosneft was basically the, um, the collection of, of uh, Soviet oil leftovers after Luke Oil was privatized and Surgut Neftegaz was privatized, et cetera. The leftovers, the bobbing lifeboats, the, the, the crapped out remains, all got grouped together and called Rosneft. Uh, and this was in itself quite a development because initially the, the post-Soviet Russian government didn't want a national oil company, believe it or not. Uh, that was it. We're, we're out of the oil business. Uh, but they were prevailed upon to take on Rosneft, partly because Rosneft was, uh, needed, needed subsidies, needed help. Someone had to pay the, pay the, pay the salaries. Um, so here we have Rosneft. The, the big turning point, the crucial turning point for Rosneft was the Yukos affair. And by absorbing Yugansk Neftigaz, the top property of, of um, uh, Yukos, um, Rosneft basically acquired an oil company. Uh, and in the process, uh, they, they had a very good manager, uh, and, then, and then Putin put in his own manager, uh, Igor Sechin. And Igor Sechin is a whole story, uh, which I also tell in the previous book. Uh, but uh, to understand Putin, you have to understand Sechin. And so that's the story of Rosneft. Well, OK. so. Let's do the three together, and then uh, we'll let Thane. So up here, Jeff, and then there was another one back there. So let's do three together. Thank you. Uh, Wayne Mary, the American Foreign Policy Council. Thane, I really look forward to this new book and to the one you haven't even started yet, almost even more. Bless you. But this being Washington, I have to drag you into the sordid business of current affairs on oh, pipelines. Sorry. This being Washington, I want to ask, bring you into sort of current affairs. I mean, this week, Putin is in Turkey to formally inaugurate Turkstream. The Greek prime minister is in Washington, in part to explain why Greece is now going to be buying a lot of Russian gas, and happily so. Uh, the Germans have made it very clear Nord Stream 2 is going to be finished, maybe a little late, but, it's, but they're the transit country for that, and they're going to be selling it on. I mean, there's just a lot of things going on in European energy and gas that Washington doesn't like and that we are sort of saying, no, 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 stop, uh, and adopting sanctions against some of our friends and allies and maybe doing more sanctions against our actual allies. Could you comment a little much? You said in one of your earlier comments that we're all adults here. Let me ask you a question. In looking at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue, is that really true on the topics that you, you address? Uh, could you talk a little bit about American public policy thinking on these issues in this new year, 2020? Perfect. Hold on to that thought. Uh, oh. Yeah. 
Just a I was going to do the same thing. This is, I'm Matt Sager's uh, Thane's colleague at IHS Market, and I was going to ask the same question. From a Washington standpoint, uh, do they have ears, but do they not hear, is the question that I want to ask you. Because basically, to me, the key story is that Europe has gone through in a dramatic change. Uh, they are basically consumer empowered because they are consumers. And basically the key question is, does supply even matter now anymore? Just kind of a, a follow up on that. So kind of, do they have ears, but do they not hear? Uh, am I wrong in terms of the overall story? Okay, let's go to back there, Jeff. Okay. So um, Jeff Mankoff with CSIS Russian Eurasia program. So Wayne mentioned TurkStream, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about the Russia-Turkey gas relationship and how that developed and what role it plays in Russia's overall strategic thinking about the gas relationship with Europe and sort of what are the factors that have allowed it to develop as rapidly as it has. Perfect. And the final back there. David Abramson, uh, State Department. Um, I'm just wondering uh, how successful you think Novatech, even with Putin's blessing, um, can be within the context of Russian geopolitics, commercial interests, as you talked about on both sides, um, uh, in 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 the longer run. Run, and if you could also address, um, you know, the 2024 coming up and what, how that might uh, affect things. Although that's a little probably too speculative. Perfect. Thank you. So we have. To close U.S. policy, Russia, Turkey, Novatech, 2024, in like you know 30 seconds. Just kidding. In in 30 seconds, <laughs> I will answer by citing the famous story of Lord Palmerston, the British Foreign Secretary, uh, when the chief diplomatic issue in front of Europe was the Schleswig-Holstein succession, and Palmerston famously said, "There are only three people who have ever understood." the Schleswig-Holstein succession. One of them is dead. The second has gone mad. <laughs> and I am the third, and I have forgotten. <laughs> and I have to answer that as a dodge, uh, because, well, first of all, I plead uh, that I'm an interested party, because my wife is Turkish. Uh, so we spend a lot of time in Turkey, and I've been following over the years the rise of Erdogan, uh, which is a fascinating story and uh, incidentally, the gas relationships. Uh, so uh, another Dodge answer is to say that about 30 years ago, the phone rang on my desk. You remember the telephone? There used to be a thing called the telephone. <laughs> right, my phone rang, and it was Botash, the, the Turkish gas uh, monopoly on the other end of the line. And they said, uh, Professor Gustafsson, the, the Russians have come up with this crazy idea of building a gas pipeline under the Black Sea to Turkey uh, and then uh, to supply the Turkish gas market. Are these guys serious? And my answer, my answer was, yes, you bet your boots they're serious because they will stop the Trans-Caspian pipeline in its tracks, they will create a first Ukrainian bypass, and they will open up the Turkish gas market. Those are Gazprom's three objectives for Blue Stream. Lo and behold, they were satisfied brilliantly and that was the beginning, really, of the, of the, the, the modern era of, of Gazprom's strategy. Uh, so it all begins right there. That, from that point on, it becomes so complicated that I, I wouldn't even venture an answer. I, I'm not even the third, uh, and I've forgotten most of it. You'll have to ask uh, Matt Sagers. So Matt will answer his own question. That's the bottom line here. Well, um, I just wanted to really thank uh, Thane for coming. Please join me in thanking Kane for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming.